uh, begin a new series today called Searching for Significance, Finding Meaning uh, in the Mundane. And we're excited as we just pray for what God's speaking to us. Um, for us, with what our speaking style is, you'll go to different churches and you'll hear different ways of communicating. Some really are focused on exegesis and going line by line through different epistles, things of that nature. For us, we really focus on the narratives. We focus on important uh, stories. We believe that those are easy to communicate and translate, but also have deeper meaning. But the important thing is this, is if your only Bible content's coming on a Sunday, you will be woefully lacking in what's needed to live in this modern age. So for us, our goal is to empower, equip, and encourage you on a weekend, but also help you move forward. And this is where community is really important. So for us to kind of centralize our messages, we say, what else can supplement the body? So we're picking different books that can be supplemental reading. Last month, we read The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Uh, now we're focusing on a book called Every Good Endeavor by Tim Keller. How many have ever heard Tim Keller before? Amazing communicator, teacher, one of the best in the country. And it's really about how do we redeem the workplace as a kingdom effort with kingdom impact. For a lot of us, we get lost in our nine to five, but really for us, we have to understand that we're called as kingdom agents. And what does it mean to redeem our workplace, our home life as a mission field? So we want to encourage you with that. Also, you'll see these questions on social media. Now, I just want to challenge those that are really linear. Uh, Pastor Bob and I and others, we are linear people as well. Well, Bob, not so much. But sometimes we won't get to the points that we want to preach on a Sunday morning. We just won't. We spend hours studying and preparing things. And if you're here last service, what I prepared to speak, I ended up not speaking on to its fullest. And, and for us, we really want to follow what the Spirit is speaking and saying to our church. So uh, we're trying to bring things that are structural and practical for you uh, to take during your weekday. Sound good? Uh, so with this series, I'll be focusing more on kingdom, and then we'll be talking about workplace as well. So do me a favor. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, verse 51. And 52, we'll read this, and then we'll pray. And then at the end of the message, uh, my good friends Danny and Krista Hawley will be sharing their story on uh, adoption and overcoming some very serious things in their life. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 51 says this. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples. Have you understood all of this, Jesus said. The disciples answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for this morning. God, to celebrate beautiful lives that were being dedicated. Again, we bless those families and the new venture they have in raising these kids to seek you. We pray as we study your word and read passages that are familiar and unfamiliar. Holy Spirit, breathe life upon them. Your word is living, it's active, it's sharper than anything that we can touch or comprehend. And we ask God that you would divide our hearts now. You would expose the dead parts of our heart. Like a perfect cardiologist, would you come in and identify where growth and life and hope need to increase. And we pray as we live in this culture that is in seeming chaos. As fear has come in with the threat of an epidemic and virus, we thank you that our safety and security are found in you, Jesus. That we do not need to be afraid, for behold, you have overcome the world. And God, we stand in that confidence. Pray for those here that have been weary, that have been overwhelmed. God, we pray for those that have been fighting against loneliness, just eyes closed in the room, you've been really feeling this sense of being alone, of facing despair. Again, this is a personal question, but if that's you, just go ahead and lift your hand. If that's you right now. Father, we declare that you are the God of all comfort, that they are not alone. There is a family here that loves them. There's a family here that is ready to be in relationship with them. But more importantly, there is a God who's available for relationship. And God, we just pray that you would Bring like a blanket of comfort over them, Holy Spirit. Where there's been fear and disillusionment and worry, those that have recently lost jobs. God, we thank you that you are our provider, Holy Spirit. We are sensitive to those areas of need, and we just ask, God, that you would come and make their footsteps firm. And they would stand upon the rock of their salvation. They would trust that you are the one that can bring confidence that they would not grow weary in doing good. I also feel there's some people here that you've been having to serve people that really don't deserve to be loved. 
you feel like this is the last person I want to help. Father, we thank you that when we serve them, when we love them, we're loving you in return. We're loving past the hurt, past the pain, past the past trauma that they've experienced. And God, we pray for eyes of grace, a lens of grace, Holy Spirit, to see others how you would see them, where bitterness would settle in. Holy Spirit, we pray for healing in the heart. God, we're open to whatever you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. Good morning. When I was uh, first a new parent, as this is dedication day, uh, my wife Rachel and I were excited to have our kids. We're a biological and adoptive family. But there was this dream I had of giving my childhood toys over to my son. You all have this little image and these fantasies and these ideas of things that were special to us, passing them on to your children. So for me, I held them in a box in my garage, and the day came. My son, Justice, was five years old. I brought them out. I told Rachel, I think it's time to give my toys to Justice. So here we were. He sits in the backyard. I say, Justice, I have something special for you. This is a candy. I say, it's not candy. It's greater than candy. And he sits down. I pull out this box. I say, Justice, these are the toys I had when I was young. I bring out Leonardo and Donatello and Michelangelo. <laughs> And General, General Infantry Joseph, G.I. Joe, and he's there. And I said, these are my toys. You played with these, Dad? <laughs> yeah, these are the toys I played with. This right here? And they're, they're antique. They're patinaed. They're well-loved. He says, this is what you play with? Thanks, Dad. They're kind of weird. And he threw them in his toy box. <laughs> Did not go how as I planned. See, we have these things and these ideas that we hope will translate over to the next generations, things that we can pass on in our lineage. Now, very few toys actually transposed to my children's generation except for one, and that's the Lego. Lego has transformed this culture yet again. Everyone's played with them, and I don't know what it is about these tactile devices, these small bricks, but there's something about the power to create and build something with your hands that transcends all ages. You know, I remember when I was in the middle of burnout about five years ago, my counselor said, do anything that you think will bring you joy as long as it's not illegal or sin. So I bought Lego sets, and I built them with my kids. There's something about constructing. So when my daughter, Sienna Rain, turned six, Frozen, the first Frozen came out, the real Frozen, not this Frozen 2 business. Frozen 1. That new song is awful. It's an awful song. Thank you. Yes. Frozen 1. She was at the age to get Legos, so she wanted the Anna and Elsa castle, the frozen, the proper frozen castle. So we get it for her. She turns six. She walks to the movie. It's her favorite thing ever. Well, one day, Rachel went out to go get groceries, and I was at home with Cena Rain and Justice. I think Farrah was just born. And as, as we're there, I hear this little voice in her room, and she's, she's playing her toys, and I hear all these words, and I can tell that she's under something, like she's doing something that's very important to her. Well, I step in, and she's built this entire castle, but she's placed it on her bookshelf, and she literally created a kingdom of all of her toys facing the ice castle. It was like a worship set in, you know, the second age. Like, I couldn't believe it. Well, I try to sneak in and get this video, and as I step in, she sees me. She says, Dad, stop. I said, what's wrong? She says, stop, Dad. Don't move another foot. So what do you mean? She said, don't step on my toys. I'm like, I'm not going to step on your toys. She said, stop. I'm building a culture of greatness. Said, Where did you hear that? From school, Dad. I'm like, well, they're teaching you something great. She said, I'm building a culture of greatness. I said, I will not interfere with your culture of greatness. And she had all these toys. I mean, you had Barbies and you had My Little Pony facing this kingdom. See, there's something in the heart of a kid that wants to do something great. There's something in the wonder of a child that says, I want to make an impact that's significant. I remember growing up and being asked what you wanted to do. And what was the common phrase or statement? I'm going to be a president. I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a doctor, a police officer. Now it's I'm a video gamer and a YouTuber. That's what you hear from children. I'm going to steer back to significance. But you wanted to do something that made a kingdom impact. What you would never hear from a child, even today, 
You never say, you know what? I want to go to college, walk out with about $200,000 of debt, and I want to work in a cubicle for 40 hours a week, and then retire with a great retirement, 401k, and maybe medical care. See, that wasn't the dream of any child. A child says, this is the outcome of my life, 160 hours a month in an office space with maybe a good tax break for my children. That's not the dream of a child's heart. And what happens is, in modern culture in particular, we see this mirror on social media of everything that we aren't and what we think other people are. And we see, we sit in our, our, our office chair, our desk space, and we look and we scroll through, and we say, why are they getting this and I'm not? Maybe I'm really not as important as I think I am, which is kind of true. But we start to demean our significance and what we're actually called to be and who God created us to be. And we wrestle with this place of, is there any meaning in life, and this is where we see addiction is now settled in culture. We get affirmation from pornography. We get pain relief from prescriptions. When there's this ache and this longing of the human heart to be and mean something of significance. And one of the concepts I believe that's missing in the diet of the church today is the concept of kingdom. Kingdom is something that we've missed. We love talking about the love of God. The peace of God, the joy of God. But for a lot of us, we miss this concept of kingdom where I really believe calling comes into an effect. Without kingdom, there's no calling. We don't understand our significance that God has placed within us to make a significant impact. Now, when you say the word kingdom, a couple pictures come to mind. We tend to think of castles. Maybe you think of Marienburg Castle in Germany. Maybe you think of the Magic Kingdom in Anaheim. I don't know what comes to your mind. However, we tend to think of these physical structures that take place, or these physical things that are built or constructed. See, the word kingdom comes from this Greek word basilia, which was where we get the word basilica. It's not a coincidence that after Constantine became a Christian, what's the first thing he edicts? He builds a basilica. We see there's this mindset or this concept that kingdoms are constructed with things or bricks built by hands. However, we understand that the kingdom concept that's used all throughout the Gospels is this. This kingdom, this word used, means a kingship, royal power, royal rule, a territory ruled by the king. Now, for us, we hear this concept from time to time. We'll read through it. We often don't hear sermons about it. But here's something that's interesting. In the book of Matthew alone, the word kingdom is used 53 times. Just to put this in perspective, the word love in the book of Matthew, 11 times. Joy, six times. Peace, three times. See, the Matthew, this disciple, is trying to communicate this concept to the early church about the importance of the rule of Jesus that's now arrived. There's a kingdom that's now come. In Mark chapter 1, he says, The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. So we have to understand that this gospel we carry is not just this get out of hell free card, but we come and carry a good news, a gospel of freedom in every area of your life. So what he does is he declares the kingdom, and the most common thing to do would be then rally your army. If you're a messianic claimant, if you believe you're the son of God, you're going to get an army, and you're going to overthrow Rome. That's what they believed would happen. Jesus doesn't do this. What does he do? He grabs tax collectors and fishermen, begins to teach them the secrets of the kingdom, and then he starts to set people free of their disease and their illness unexpected display of kingdom. So the Pharisees that are kind of the big dogs at the time come over to Jesus and say, when's the kingdom actually going to come? Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, was the kingdom of God coming? And he answered, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. Now, this is a verse that's really hard for us to translate. And you may have heard it when you were younger, displayed as the kingdom of God is within you. 
It can be translated either way, but we have to understand context. Context is really important in Scripture. And we have to look at the disciples aren't the one that are asking this question. It's actually the Pharisees that are asking this question. And let me just tell you this. They did not understand what the kingdom of God was. So I find it hard to believe that the kingdom is within them. But when they make this declaration, where's the kingdom? He says, listen, the kingdom isn't something that you construct by hand. The kingdom of God is among you. And what he's implying is you're looking right at it. And its name is Jesus. The kingdom's arrived, and you need to open your eyes and actually see what's in front of you. One scholar writes this. The Pharisees do not understand the nature of the kingdom. The kingdom is discerned by faith, not by empirical observation. It is within their grasp if they will only act to seize it. It gives this picture of the woman with the issue of blood. You ever read that story before? Where she's sick, she's ill, she's tried everything, sees Jesus, hears a rumor that he's walking by, reaches out her hand and grabs the hand of his garment. And what happens? Power comes out from him. And she's healed and she's restored. And what Jesus is presenting is there's a power that's available through his kingdom. You have to seize control of it and have to put your hand on him. And he calls these Pharisees out of this preconceived mindset. And let me tell you this. Your ideas of Jesus' kingdom come in your life won't look how you expect. As it didn't the Pharisees. And kingdom's interruption in your life. Jesus' interruption in your life is not always convenient. See, Jesus doesn't just like to show up for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning and let you live the rest of your life how you wish it would be lived. See, Jesus wants to come in and take kingship over every area of your life, not just that which you want him to. He's inviting you in as a king and saying, will you come and rule alongside of me? Unbelievable what this invitation is. See, now this group of fishermen that he calls to his side in Matthew chapter 13, where we really see the picture of the kingdom, he begins to speak in parables. Now, parables are incredibly hard to understand. It's actually intentional. The reason why parables are hard to understand is there are these, these mysteries. He literally says, I'm going to give you the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to give you the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And as he says this, he begins to speak to them in parables. Now, parables at that time used natural things you would point to, like he points to a mustard seed. He points to the seed sower, the field, or the woman that lost her coin. He points to natural things, but they were supposed to have such a spiritual impact that they would disturb your mind. How many knows to get disturbed is actually a good thing from time to time? And what he does is he begins to share these parables. This is what one uh, person says. In the preaching of Jesus' parables, they were disturbing stories that threatened the hearer's secure worldview, the world of assumptions by which they habitually lived, the unnoticed framework of our thinking in which we interpret our data. What does that mean? See, Jesus speaks to us in mysteries in a way to disturb us and to unsettle all those thoughts that are dictating our life. Culture would call them limiting beliefs. We call them lies. See, there's lies that we've adopted. There's false ideologies that we've signed up to. And what one scholar says, he says, these parables come in and they unearth communism, they unearth capitalism so that you can understand what kingdom living actually is and is about. At the end of these series of parables, he then says in Matthew 13, 51, do you understand these sayings? I love Matthew. He has a sense of humor. The disciples reply, yes. They didn't understand anything he said. They had no clue. They had no concept. But as he says this closing parable, now that you understand these things, you then are like scribes that are masters of a household that are called to bring out both old and new treasure. Now, I've read that hundreds of times and always am scratching my head at that one. What exactly is he saying? And there's no way these disciples understood it. We've heard these dozens, if not hundreds of times, and we still are confused. They definitely don't know what this means. Now, when we study the significance of it, again, we're far removed from the first century. He references a very well-known term called the scribe. Now, the scribe in the Old Testament was somebody that would steward what they called the Torah, the first five books of the law. As they would steward it, it says that these scribes would study it, they would understand it, and they would sit at home with obscurity. 
What does this mean? They would sit in the place where they did not understand everything and they were okay with it. See, Jesus commits that these disciples are now like scribes, like the Old Testament stewards of the Torah. That there's going to be things that you will not understand. But you have to trust me in what you don't understand. Secondly, he says, you're like masters in a household that steward old and new treasure. What on earth is he talking about? Now, let's remove that. Many of us here are not Jewish by descent. You're Gentiles. You're people that are removed from that context. And many that were getting saved in the first century were not Jews. They were these Gentiles. Now, if they were to read this, this is the brilliance of Jesus. They would hear that word scribe and not really have any Old Testament identification to it. They would understand the Greco-Roman usage and the actual literal translation of this phrase that he's now giving you to his disciples is this, that they are scribes in the kingdom. They are chief executive officers of a governmental entity. This is what he says. You then like scribes, like masters in the house, are CEOs for my kingdom. It's unheard of. Let's think about this. Education, none. Qualifications, zero. Sold everything, yes. That's all they got. They're following Jesus, and he entrusts the stewardship of this kingdom to people that are unqualified. And might I add, so are you. All of us are. None of us deserve a rightful place in this kingdom called heaven. None of us have earned it. He says, I have a food you know not of. I teach things you don't understand. And he says, I've entrusted you. And they're there saying, yes, they have no clue what they're entrusting him with. And here's the mystery of it. He says, you're called to bring out both old and new treasure. Old treasure they would understand. That's the Torah. That's old revelation. What's the new treasure? It's the power to set people free. You have power to set the captive free. That was the call of the Messiah. That was the awakening of the kingdom. Well, how is this so? He said it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to what? Preach good news. To set people free. To open the eyes of the blind. The old treasure was the promises of the Messiah. Was the promises of the coming kingdom. He says it's now arrived. And guess what? You're stewards of its treasure. That's your responsibility. As CEOs in the kingdom. And we wrestle with significance. And we wrestle. What's my purpose? God, just give me a prophetic word. He did. It's done. You don't need any more. What I love about all my friends that I preach with, friends I get to know like Sean and others, we all have asked our testimonies, feeble testimonies, nothing significant. You know, we even got public words from stages. None of us. We had to hear the voice. You have to hear the voice. You have to grab a hold of the robe of the one that is speaking. Stop waiting for some mantle to fall on your shoulders. It's called Jesus. He did it at the cross. And now he's invited you into his kingdom as kingdom emissaries. This will shake nations. And here's what we have to understand is in our culture, our identity is informed by a few different things. Modern day, our identity is defined by three things. Your income, how much you make, your intelligence, where did you go to school? And now the modern one, which I can't stand, your influence. Your income, your intelligence, your influence. I was on a trip recently with somebody. People were on the trip that loved the Lord, people that didn't know the Lord. Ask one of them what they did. She said, I'm an influencer. I said, you're a what? I'm an influencer. What does that mean? Well, I promote products on social media. and So you're an employee of Instagram. That's what you are. Found out later, she took pictures and just stewarded her parents' trust fund. See, influence is when people are willing to follow you into war and follow you in your things that matter. If you think you have a following, tell them you're all going to go serve at Loaves and Fishes tomorrow. See how many of your followers show up. <laughs> See, those that had influence are those that actually make differences and don't peddle products for fun. 
See, we have to understand, if you want to see kingdom impact take place, you have to go where no one else is willing to go. And that's what Jesus did. They asked him, when are you going to bring the kingdom? He said, I did with those that were poor and those that were oppressed and those that were hurting and those that were sick and those that needed kingdom power in their life. If you want to see miracles, stop waiting for a magic altar call. Go to those that are desperate in need of healing. Don't wait for another baptism of the Spirit. It's on you. It's called Jesus, and His Holy Spirit's come inside of you. It's time to see the kingdom of God at hand in your own life, not just 2,000 years ago. This is the invitation. He says it's in you. So we have to ask this question, where does our identity come from? Where do we get our identity informed? If I don't have the income, if I don't have the intelligence, you didn't go to Stanford or Harvard, you didn't have these Instagram followers or this influence that's perceived in modern day. Let me tell you this. Ephesians 1 says you have an inheritance called the kingdom. Read it. Study it. I went to one leader one time in my life. I said, you know, I'm getting lost in my life. I need to know what God's calling me to. He said, read Ephesians 1 every day for a month. Come back to me. When I walked away, I've been called. I have an inheritance in the things that matter in life. My income doesn't define me. The inheritance that Jesus died for is now available to me. Secondly is this, that maybe you didn't go to a great school, but you now have insight through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Well, we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation at hand in our own life where we can help solve complex problems. You give me a room of people that come from MIT, I'll take the room filled with those that pray. I guarantee we'll solve the problem in hand. You want to have those that know insight through the spirit of wisdom. And I loved mentoring people along the way that said they weren't very smart. You start studying that Bible, I guarantee your intelligence will blossom and grow. Last thing is this, influence. We now have intimacy with the king. You say, well, how did this coincide? See, our culture wants to be known. You want to be known, so therefore you have a following, an influence so you can be known by people, but the longing of the heart is to be known by the one that created you. And from that place of intimacy, you can effectively lead and influence others. You have been called as executive officers in the kingdom. You wonder what your significance is. It looks like inviting the kingdom into that cubicle. When you're there from nine to five and you're sitting there, you know who's with you? The Holy Spirit. The one that hovered over the waters in Genesis 1 and 2. Over the chaos, he's by your side and he's willing to help. In those moments when you feel like there's nothing going on, you're invited to the throne room of heaven to be able to pray for that which needs to be changed. God's placed you around people that are in desperate need of his healing power, and that's your responsibility, and that's your first job. And guess what? If you get fired for doing the will of God, I guarantee he's going to show up with another job opportunity. No doubts about that. We have to be willing to no longer bow to the powers of this age, but know that we were called to dispel those that are under the oppressive power of the enemy. We're called to bring healing and hope and help to those that are in need. So for many of us, maybe you're here and you're a stay-at-home parent. You're watching your kids just trying to get by and you're in between diapers and cleaning up Cheerios. Guess what? When you're at the park and you see those little ones that are there and a friend's there and they walk by and their child's in the middle of gender dysphoria. They're questioning their gender. You get to pray and speak life into that child's eyes. When many are modeling the addiction of their parents, you can be the one that speaks truth and life into them. Invite the Holy Spirit into that process, knowing that our search for significance is found in Jesus alone not in some external opportunity or success story. The most important thing in this moment I want us to know and recognize is there are many of us feel disqualified because there's areas of brokenness in our life. There's areas of hurt and shame. This is when we get to bring these to the foot of the cross. And like the disciples, we get to let go of our nets. We get to let go of our boats and follow him.